Baseball is a red-blooded sport for red-blooded men. It's no pink tea, and Molly Coddles had better stay out. It's a struggle for supremacy, a survival of the fittest. Ty Cobb liked sentimentality in his opponents because he had none himself. Baseball, he said, is something like a war. Ty Cobb is one of the great natural forces of baseball. He is a testament to how far you can get simply through will. I don't think Ty Cobb had tremendous, tremendous natural ability. I don't think he would be a great athlete today. But his intensity, his drive was unparalleled. Cobb was pursued by demons from his childhood, from his parentage, from his racial consciousness, and he took out all of his aggressions on the playing field. Everyone was his enemy. It was easy for Cobb to play the game of baseball as if it were the game of life, and it was a violent struggle every day, 154 games a year. He was born on a Georgia farm in 1886 and named Tyrus after the ancient city of Tyre that stubbornly refused to surrender to Alexander the Great. His mother, Amanda, was just 15. His father, William H. Cobb, was a schoolmaster who had made good and was grimly determined that his son make good too in medicine or law or the military. His father was distant, demanding. The only man who ever made me do his bidding, his son remembered, Nothing young Tyrus could do ever seemed to satisfy him. The tense, skinny boy took out his anger on the diamond and on his schoolmates. In the fifth grade, he beat up a fat boy whose error had let the girls' team win a spelling bee. He left home at 17 to play in the minors in Alabama and Tennessee. His father warned him, don't come home a failure. That admonition, Cobb recalled, put more determination in me than he ever knew. My overwhelming need was to prove myself as a man. When no big league offers came right away, he forged letters praising his own skills and dispatched them to Grantland Rice, sports editor of the Atlanta Journal. Finally, Rice wrote, there's a young fellow named Cobb who seems to be showing an unusual amount of talent. He eventually got a job playing left field for Augusta in the South Atlantic League and soon led that league in hitting. Sale to a major league team seemed only weeks away, a sure sign of the success with which he hoped to win his father's favor. Then Cobb got a telegram. His father was dead, shotgunned. Cobb's own mother had shot him. Her husband thought she was having an affair, and when he tried to slip into her bedroom window at night to trap her with her lover, she shot him twice. Later, she said, she had mistaken him for a prowler. My father had his head blown off when I was 18 years old by a member of my own family, Cobb told a writer when he was an old man. I didn't get over that. I've never gotten over it. Three weeks after his father was killed, on August 30th, 1905, Ty Cobb played his first game for the Detroit Tigers. Every rookie gets a little hazing, but most of them just take it and laugh. Cobb took it the wrong way. He came up with an antagonistic attitude which in his mind turned any little razzing into a life and death struggle. He always figured everybody was ganging up on him. He came up from the south and he was still fighting the civil war. As far as he was concerned, we were all damn Yankees before he even met us. Sam Crawford. Sure I fought. I had to fight all my life to survive. They were all against me. 
Tried every dirty trick to cut me down, but I beat the bastards and left them in the ditch. It's an old baseball aphorism that you can't play baseball with your teeth touched. You have to be sort of relaxed, balanced temperament. Ty Cobb played all his career with his teeth clenched, his fists clenched. Despised often by his teammates, he, you know, once when they thought he'd lost a batting title, they sent a, his own teammates sent a telegram of congratulations to the man who beat him. A man of such fierce determination to play that uh, one time in an exhibition game in Toledo, Ohio, he went, uh, had tonsillitis. He went and had his tonsils out by a quack who was later sent to an insane asylum uh, without anesthetics, played later that day. He was now widely hailed as the best player in the game and was one of the best paid, making $9,500 a year. He was careful with his money and had already begun to invest in the small Georgia soft drink company, Coca-Cola, that would soon help make him baseball's richest player. But no degree of success could exercise his demons. On May 15, 1912, at Hilltop Park in Manhattan, Ty Cobb endured the taunts of a New York fan, Claude Luker, until after the third inning, when Luker shouted that Cobb was a half nigger. Cobb vaulted the railing, knocked down the heckler, and began stomping him with his spikes. When the crowd shouted that the man was helpless because he had no hands, Cobb replied, I don't care if he doesn't have any feet and kept kicking him until a park policeman pulled him away. Van Johnson, president of the American League, suspended Cobb from organized baseball indefinitely. Everybody took it as a joke. I was only kidding that fellow and I frightened him to death. But I would not take from the United States Army what that man said to me. Fans in New York cheered me to the echo when I left the field. I don't look for applause, but for the first time in my life, I was glad that the fans were with me. Although his teammates despised Cobb, they thought he'd been justified. Being called a half nigger was considered an insult too great for any white man to bear. They refused to play until he was reinstated. It was the first player's strike in Major League history. The Tiger manager desperately rounded up a team of amateurs for the next day's game against Philadelphia. A seminary student pitched for Detroit that afternoon, and the new Tigers lost 24-2. The next game was canceled. Van Johnson now warned that he would suspend every Tiger from the game unless they all agreed to return to the field. Cobb urged his teammates to give in. And when they did, they were each fined $100. After Cobb paid only a $50 fine for the savage beating, Johnson lifted his suspension. One sports writer said he would climb a mountain to punch an echo. Another suggested that he was possessed by the Furies. He waited at the plate with his hands wide apart so that he could bunt or punch or slap the ball just where he wanted it to go. Few could match the speed of his takeoff from first. And it took a brave man to block the base path when he slid in spikes high. One pitcher covering home as Cobb came in with what he called my steel showing, is said to have fled from the field. If I hadn't been determined to outdo the other fella at all costs, I doubt I would have hit 320. In other words, my lifetime batting average has been increased at least 50 points, a qualities I'd call purely mental. He was the biggest draw in baseball, more admired than loved. All across the country, fans now began to argue over who was better, Cobb or the great Honus Wagner.
Cobb's ferocity drove his team to the pennant in 1907 and himself to the batting championship of the American League. At 20 years and 10 months, Ty Cobb was the youngest man ever to win a big league batting title. He would win seven more in a row, 12 in 13 years. He was, one writer said, a cyclone, a tornado, a typhoon, all rolled into one. The cruelty of Cobb's style fascinated the multitudes, but it also alienated them. He played in a climate of hostility, friendless by choice, in a violent world he populated with enemies. He was the strangest of all our sports idols, but not even his disagreeable character could destroy the image of his greatness as a ball player. Ty Cobb was the best. That seemed to be all he wanted. Jimmy Cannon. I think baseball is a great support uh, to people who have emotional voids, gaps, emotional difficulties. That is to say, all of us. Those parts of us that don't function well, uh, those parts of us that are sad or depressed, not every day, um, they can really use baseball. It isn't just the uh, child in a wheelchair or the shut-in senior citizen listening to the radio that needs the game. There's part of us, part of everybody who's a baseball fan, uh, that needs the game at that level. The greatness of Ty Cobb was something that had to be seen. And to see him was to remember him forever. George Sisler. He was 74 years old and dying of cancer. He had traveled more or less ceaselessly since leaving the game, drinking, gambling, quarreling with waiters and taxi drivers and sales clerks, deploring the integration of the game, charging fans for his autograph, driving off first one wife and then another. He stayed on the road as long as he could, carrying with him everywhere a Luger and a paper bag filled with a million dollars in securities, and each day swallowing a quart of bourbon mixed with milk to dull the pain. Where's anybody who cares about me, he asked one visitor. The world's lousy, no good. He died on July 17th, 1961. His lifetime batting average was 367, the highest in history. 400 people attended his funeral at Royston, Georgia, the little town where he had learned his baseball as a boy. Most of them little leaguers to whom he was only a name from baseball legend. But of all the men who had actually played with him, only three showed up. I'd had my life to live over again, he had told a caller toward the end. I'd have done things a little different. I would have had more friends. <laughs>